Welcome to Rays Nation Radio, live from the Country Music Hall of Fame at the 8th Annual Rays Conference in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Dawn Lego, and I could not be more excited about this year's conference. Over the next two days, we'll talk to fundraising leaders about the latest and greatest from the nonprofit world. We'll explore hot button issues, innovative ideas, and bring you all the energy from the Music City. And joining me is my fantastic co-host, Matt Bitsagai from DonorDoc. Thanks, Don. We are so excited to be here. We can't wait to share with you some innovative fundraising strategies, some inspiring stories. Buckle up, everyone, and get ready. We are about to raise the bar together. Welcome, Welcome to, to Raise, raise Nation, Nation Radio. Radio. back. It is day two at the race conference and we are at the broadcast studio with my co-host Matt Vitsagai from Donor Doc. But Matt, something you don't know, my original co-host when we launched the show 151 episodes ago was the amazing Mr. Ben Farrell. We well. hosted a couple of episodes together, I think about 20 or so, the first. So you helped us launch Raise Nation Radio, a platform where we just bring fundraising inspiration to our audiences. So welcome back, Ben. Oh, I am thrilled to be here. And I do remember those exciting early days. And look, it's been nothing but upward uh, ever since. It's been great to hear all of the guests coming in here, sharing the ideas. That's what it's all about. Rays, I like to say it is, we're listening together, we're learning together, and we're continuing to make a difference together. It's just great to be here. Well, welcome back. How does it feel? You're, you'll be on the stage or already took the stage for us? I already was on the stage this morning. We were talking about uh, the timing, right? Is Miles Davis said, timing is not the main thing, it's the only thing. Mm -hmm. You've got to have good timing with your event because if you run out of time, you run out of opportunity, your guests leave. So we had a great, great session this morning. So what was the main message? You give us the top three well, off from that stage. Sure. We, we mainly said evaluate what you're doing, when you're doing it, and why you're doing it. If you say you never want to be majoring in the minor things, mm -hmm. and it's easy to be distracted with an event with a lot going on, that you lose focus of the most important pillars, which is the connection with the donors and raising the money for your mission. And so for this year, we have done something a little bit different, which is we've shifted our live auction to the start of the program. Guests oh, arrive, really? they sit, they, they socialize, bid on their phones, of course, and then they sit down and we start with the three W's, which I know you're familiar with, who we are, what we do, and most importantly, why we do it. Get everyone in the right space and then kick things off with the live auction. That's new. It is new, and people are loving it mm -hmm. because we shared today that the humble goldfish has an attention span of nine seconds, and the average adult American is down to 8.25. So you're going to want... Is that true? Where yeah, did that, that data come from, Ben? Uh, the Internet, Don, the Internet. Okay, the internet. The, what is that? <laughs> so it was, a, it was a thought leader, so people are worried about young kids, and I won't get yeah. too sidetracked there, but our young children still have a, a much stronger attention span than adults, than adults right now. So they're able to focus for long periods of time, but I'm part of the National Speakers Association, and so uh, someone was presenting there and shared, you know, we can only hold an audience's attention for about eight to ten minutes without some sort of interruption or disruption mm -hmm. to get them back on track. Mm -hmm. So I noticed that to be true in these auctions that we do. Our group does about 250 live auctions around the country a year. There are five of us. 250? 250 events in total, yep. And um, we found by shifting the live auction early, number one, alcohol is under control. Mm. Maybe they had a drink while they're getting ready. When they arrived, they got one cocktail and they have their second, then they sit down. So they're full of energy. The night is still young. There's no food service getting in the way, no scraping of the plates. Or in some parts of uh, America, like where I've certainly lived in North Carolina, the portions, they bring, they, they, they bring big portions, mm -hmm. lots of meat, lots of potatoes. You don't want those carbs sitting in. But the most important thing is maintaining the attention of the audience. I think I like this mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. That's because interesting. Because when I think of the traditional or the program that we've known for a hundred years, it's always been, you know, the cocktail hour, bidding on some silent auctions, and you come in and it's hurry up and wait, and then you're waiting for your salad, and then 
I think we start to lose the audience. So checking in with the babysitter, there, do you know all the things, right? And then if they are on the dance floor, then all we're doing is disrupting that celebration and party. I kind of love this. When did this all happen? Well, it started. Um, you know, I started to notice that we were running out of time at the end of the night, and I oh. noticed that the live auction. And the paddle raise, the two biggest components of the fundraising elements of the program part, were always coming late. And so there was an opportunity for all these other things to get in the way. Mm -hmm. Food dinner is delayed. There's a delay. A speaker comes up and goes off script. There's a delay. Uh, someone receives an award. They talk too long. All this does is just take away the valuable time, valuable time. Deprioritizes mm -hmm. the most important thing of the event. Indeed. And you, you nailed it on the head when you said checking in with the babysitter. So mm -hmm. think about any time you go out to dinner. Yep. You go out to dinner. You have a meal, you have dessert, and then what do you do? You go home. Go home. So why would we ask all of our donors to ha now have their dinner, have their dessert, oh, and then stay for another mm -hmm. hour mm -hmm. uh, while we ask you for money? And then the last thing, you know, there's a great book by Daniel Pink called When. It's about the science of timing. And people remember a peak experience which, you know, I hope is there going to be our fun to need moment, our mission moment. And then they remember the ending. Mm -hmm. So if the last thing you're doing is making them wait in their seat too long, that's what they're going to Hurry remember. Hurry up and wait. And we that's don't want that. But events want... have always been, yeah. I, as I can remember. Yeah. That's right. Hurry up and wait. And you know what I also like about this, Ben, which I'm sure you thought of, but if you do well, and with your service, I'm sure that they will do well. Um, but then the whole night is about celebrating the success that happened from the mission moment. That's good, so good that's, point. Yeah. you know, it's like, it's, let, now let's celebrate. We did the work, let's celebrate. Oh, for sure. Uh, what a heartbreaking moment for a charity that has paid, you know, ten or $12,000 for an amazing band. And by the time you release your audience to go listen to them, they have time to perform one song. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. You're right. It's, it allows you just to stay on time. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, things happen, right? Traffic and weather and technology and, uh, you know, we've had places where they're, we're working on our internet for you. Well, if you do this new model of having your live auction first, you can make up time during that dinner mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. You have time to, to gain back, yeah. make up that time. So it has really worked well. Uh, people have really enjoyed it. And for all the One Cause listeners, right, who are having a silent auction on the phone, during this dinner program, you have uninterrupted time to focus on the silent, mm -hmm. count down the close to silent, mm -hmm. tell people to get their phones out. I say not nose to the grindstone, it's nose to the smartphone. Mm -hmm. Focus <laughs> on the items, right? Oh, that's and you can be the make one close new tagline. Well, it could be. Yeah, no more. Yeah, no more. So it really. It just allows the energy and the focus to be back on that auction where it needs to be because otherwise the silent auction could close during a video or mm -hmm. during the live mm -hmm. or during a speaker. And then if people don't have access to the bidding, they're not going to bid. I yeah. love this. I'm yeah. so, and I'm so, it's so ingenious. It, it's so yeah. small, but it really is brilliant. So it's, Kudos to you for thinking about I, it. I have a question, Ben. I'm, I'm a pretty, like, data-driven, you know, analytical person in a lot of ways. So how has this, like, even if it's just anecdotal, like, have you seen this be create a big increase in terms of, you know, the the effectiveness of the auction as far as raising giving in the money. room. Yeah, yeah like the giving has, in the has, it, has it made an impact that way? Oh, for sure. That's a great question. It absolutely has because number one, if you don't have the attention of the audience, you have less participation. Mm -hmm. Less participation is less bids, less bids, less money. Mm -hmm. So by getting all that energy up front, the live auction results have, like I would say here we are in 2024, mm -hmm. half of this year has gone by. We are seeing the highest and best results wow. in the Good history and I'm in my 21st Events are year. Wow. And so people like, well, it's an, shh, it's an election year. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter that it's an election year. It doesn't matter that there's inflation. It doesn't matter if you got a wintry mix. Mm -hmm. it, people want to make a difference. And they want, they want to build bridges of understanding. They want to invest in the charities they care about. So if you give them a good recipe to do so, they'll do it. Yeah. And the silent auction has been a great blessing is that the silent auction results have increased because we have a dedicated time for what we like to call the concentrated close. Sure. And just a couple of bids from, you know, one or two more bids from everyone in the room goes a very long way. Yeah, absolutely. So Ben, what did you just say? You've been around for about 21 years, is that right? That's right, I went to auctioneer There's school in 2003. Wow, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, events have definitely changed, right? There's oh, been sure. such, I feel like there was this 
longevity of we did it one way for the longest time, and that was the only way, right? We didn't deviate. We had that script. Then that COVID thing happened. That turned everything upside down. Then there was a coming back from. But now we're just evolving and transforming and getting more creative. Give us your assessment of where how events are changing, aside from just the timing. Well, COVID was a absolute. Crazy. Well, it was crazy, but I'm saying it was a blessing. I agree. It was an I absolute agree. blessing. 100%. It's a, it was an emotional, psychological reset. People really saw the value in community. Yeah. The moment it was taken away, oh, we long to be with one another mm -hmm. again. When they've been coming back to events, they were so excited and grateful to be back and in person. And so I feel like there's just a, an extra commitment now that uh, of current events where people are still reeling with that positive energy of, and gratitude of coming back. Now, I will say the modern event is more efficient than it's ever been. So we have fewer items raising more money. Quality over quantity. Quality over quantity, absolutely for sure. And, you know, I told a story this morning. Uh, people are like worried about, you know, coming out of COVID or, uh, you know, inflation or the presidential election is happening, all these worries and concerns. And I shared a story about a guy named Ruel Gridley. Ruel Gridley? Gridley, okay. 1864, during the American Civil War, he lost a bet and had to walk down the street carrying a 50 pound sack of flour. And at the end he said, what should I do? The whole town was out, of course, laughing and jeering him on. And he said, what should I do with the flour? Someone said, sell it, and we'll give it to the sanitary fund. Sanitary fund was a neutral commission that gave money to soldiers who were suffering, of course, food, clothes, medical supplies. Well, he sold it and he said, Congratulations, where should I deliver your flower? The guy says, don't deliver it, sell it again. The next guy bought it and said, sell it again. And he sold that same sack of flour 300 times that day. No. Yes. He went on to sell that in multiple cities all over America, all over the West Coast, and he raised, in today's money, over $4 million wow. with one sack of flour. So I just... That's an example mm -hmm. of what is in the heart of people who live here. They want to make a difference. You just give them a chance, and they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. All right, so now let's look at it the other way. Where do you think events are going? What are you hopeful for? What, what, are, we, what are we expecting to change in events maybe over the next five years? Any predictions? Well, I see charities actually hosting more events. More. So there has been this challenge of, listen, you know, we're running out of space at our venue. Do we go bigger? Do we go bigger? Do we go bigger? You know, there are some events I do where there are over a thousand guests. That's a massive undertaking. So what some charities are doing is having their main, you know, black tie or formal gala, and then adding something in either the spring or the fall, adding something at the holiday period. So many people are missing this holiday, December. That's when so many people have the giving spirit, of course. And so what they're doing is adding more events, more opportunity, because we need to replace our donors, right? We have to always be growing. Mm -hmm. And so they're adding more fun, I call them friend raisers at times, mm -hmm. or development uh, events. We're just getting people attached to the mission. Yeah. And that's where I see a real growth, just more Variety, variety of, of events, yeah. mm -hmm. and to bring in a more diverse group. And sure. Not everybody wants to do. I don't know about. Well, you're always in a tux, Matt. I don't know if you're a tux guy, but my husband doesn't really want to put on a tux. But if I told him we were going to go in jeans and a t-shirt to a fundraiser, he might join me. You know. So. Oh well, then yeah, there are lots of events for 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 your husband out there because we have a lot of. Um, blue jeans and bow ties you and go. you know there's a, a million and one theme based events that are fun yeah. and they're all basically a way for people to wear comfortable clothes which why yeah. not yeah. of course why not so all of our event fundraisers out there listening to this uh podcast episode with the amazing ben farrell what what's the, the hottest tip that you have for them Let, close us out with one really strong hot tip they're going into the event season right we're in september we're hitting event season hard again what's that one tip that you want them to hear for this season well luckily we have 45 more minutes so here we go uh -oh. i'm just kidding i'm just kidding listen uh the main thing is if you're having a live auction okay the first thing you sell 
make sure that the first item creates an emotional moment for the entire room. Mm -hmm. Because you need to shift the awareness, you need to open the hearts of the donors and connect them to the mission. So one technique we've been using is the selling for the first item a $20 bill. So you can imagine, friends we have. Wait, what was that? It's a $20 bill? That's, That's right. the item? Yeah, this You're is so the creative then. So we say, we have a list of amazing items. Trips to Iceland, legendary Pappy Van Winkle bourbon, or a puppy, whatever it may be. Vacations, of course, are always, always great. But before we begin, I have an item that's not listed in the program. It's a surprise item. It's right here in my pocket. Now, I will have in advance gone to someone who receives the services of this group. Most recently, I'm thinking Leukemia Lymphoma Society. There was a six-year-old little boy who had received 26 chemotherapy infusions into his spine. Now, imagine, as a young, as a, it's just unimaginable. Heartbreaking. I, so I said, I have this $20 bill signed by this young man, a man who didn't complain, a man who's never given up hope, a man whose face drives him each and every day, and a person that's never going to stop fighting, and right now he's fighting for his life. So the next time you are complaining about traffic, complaining about weather, weather, complaining about news. Eggs cooked too. You can reach into your pocket, what? hold this $20 bill, and be reminded of what community's all about, what this charity's all about, and that you're here to participate. And so I say, who'll give me $30 for the $20 bill? And guess how many hands go up? They My hand just went up. up. They all <laughs> go up. So most recently, I sold, now the, the highest it's ever sold for, was ten thousand dollars? Really? Um, recently, it sold for three thousand, and in um, I think we were in San Antonio, Texas. A gentleman bought it for thirty-five hundred dollars, and he said, just like the sack of flour story, he said, so "Here it is, sell it, sell it again, yeah, sell it again, sell it again, sell it again." So what that does is it establishes in a in a real way, give more than you're getting in return, mm -hmm. because making the difference is the key. That's awesome. Mic drop. Yeah. Ben Farrell, it's so inspirational always. Thank you for being my original partner on Raise Nation Radio and coming back and being part of the Raise community and joining us again on the show. It's always a pleasure. 250 events this year. I'm not sure how are you going to do it, but you'll have to come back next year and tell us how it went. Well, I got a lot of great people helping me there, so not just me, mind you. I do, yeah. You never take the props. Yeah, well, <laughs> we are, we're very fortunate, very, very fortunate. There's a lot of great, a lot of great fundraisers, so we're just happy to be a part of it. And How's the family? Your son, your fan, your children. How's if everybody? If you had any idea how great things were going, we'll just have to have a follow-up broadcast here because um, it's all amazing, and we're right here in Nashville, so awesome. we're excited. Yeah. Thank you again. Thank you. Stephanie, hello. Hi. Welcome to Braze Nation Studio. We're so excited to have you here joining us. Thank you so much for having me. You are all involved with <laughs> One Cause and development and product development. I feel like we could pick your brain forever, but we don't have forever. Today, we only have a few minutes, so we're going to talk about technology and events. Sounds great. So I'm wondering if you can talk about how our fearless fundraisers use technology platforms like One Cause to enhance their event attendee experience. Oh, I would love to. Great. Um, <laughs> so, you know, what I really love is, is that it's all about the event, right? You want people socializing and doing that. But at the same time, people are at events wanting to give and wanting yeah. to be, th you know, philanthropic, right? Yeah. And so we make it really easy. I've seen nonprofits, you know, so that you can easily scan a QR code in order to quickly bid, but they can go and walk around the auction and see all of this stuff so that you're not on your phone all the time, but yeah. it's a quick scan, bid, um, and do that. When you're at check-in, you want to greet somebody, you know, and you want to talk to them. But I love it whenever they're like, yeah, we'll just send you a text. You can see what table number you're at, what your paddle number is, and go in and enjoy the room. So the technology is about making it continuing to be face-to-face -face yeah. so you can have those conversations, but just, ex um, you know, like accelerating it along the way. Well, and I think a lot of people want the opportunity to uh, hide behind tasks. 
Yes. I, I do as the introvert <laughs> in the room. And I love what you're saying about keeping people in relationship. It's almost like the technology should be seamless and quiet back here to facilitate what it we're is. doing in person yes, together absolutely. at a gathering at an we event. We are all about empowering the supporters. So we want you to be able to talk, you know, like engage when you need it, but not all the time because yeah. you're there to have fun and to be part of a community. Yeah. Um, so, yes. Yeah. I feel like the past five years has just been like technology innovation on like mass acceleration. <laughs> You all have done so much in the past couple of years to create new resources for event planners. What should people be watching out for? What exciting things are going on at One Cause right now that they should look for? Oh, we always have fun things in the works. Mm -hmm. um, I could talk about that forever. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, probably some of my most exciting stuff for me is the AI. And I know people are talking about AI, you know, and AI, AI. Um, Let's but hold it, its hand. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's about it being in the background and working for you, not yeah. in the foreground. So if, it, if we do our job well, you don't even know that yeah. it's there, right? Yeah. It just saves you time. And so I love that. Have you have you done an auction where you had to write all those descriptions? Oh, my God, yes. yes. So many. So so awful. <laughs> Saves so many hours and yes. just allows you to generate the descriptions or your fixed price items because they all start to sound the same over yes, time. It's true. And so I love that. Um, we've also done this thing, you know, when you have your task list, I'm a task list person. I don't yep. know about oh, yeah. you. And so you have your task list. We've leveraged AI on the back on the background in order to put the most important task at the top, depending oh. on what your time is, instead of just doing a normal task list. I love that. You don't even know that it's AI in the background yeah, doing yeah. it for you. So I love that. And then those of us who are late, I'm a night owl. And so I work <laughs> late at night, but that's maybe not when support is around. So we have trained uh, the AI AI in order to all of our training videos and all of our KB. So you can just ask it a question. We have a new AI guide so that Amazing. when you're late at night, it can give you fundraising strategy content. It can give you a how-to on what you need. So it's just in the background when yeah. you're setting up your event yeah. and you're a night out. So those are some of the, the AI things that I'm just really excited about. We live in the event space. That's what we consult yeah. on and yes. teach is fundraising events. And one of the sort of big shifts that happened in the past couple of years were hybrid events. And we were able to do an event <laughs> with utilizing the one cost tool with three different locations, all giving with one auctioneer on one stage, recognizing all three venues, three different cities entirely. So the fact that like AI and technology can be something that you're the expert in and I don't have to be the expert in yes. is such a benefit to me as an event planner. Yeah, and I think wonderful. that it's exciting to see what you all are doing. I love that you're the expert in AI, so I don't have to be. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we just want to be in the background. We don't want to be forefront. We just want to be yeah. in the background make hopefully making your job easier, yeah. right? We save you time because you have so many things that you need to think so about. So many things. I yeah. Know. So we are all here together at the Amazing Rays Conference, yes. which I'm so grateful for in Nashville. What's the thing about the Rays Conference for you that is top of mind, top of heart that you uh, enjoy? I The energy here is, you can't describe it. It's so many people that are so passionate about, you know, making a difference in the world. I love it. Um, it motivates me to be like, okay, I need to go and make this problem better. I love talking to people and saying, I did this. And I'm like, oh, I can make that better. Yeah. I can do that. And so yeah. I just, that energy, um, my whole team is here. And so we just get to to talk to the nonprofit no, to nonprofit leaders, but also go to these great sessions and learn yeah. for ourselves, right? So um, it's just, uh, oh, the energy is just amazing. And we all come back on a high um, from this and um, go in. We're like, we're going to go build this. I've already got a list of things from just, just this morning um, of talking to people. So it's great. Wow. We all get to benefit from that. What do you think folks' biggest opportunity with technologies like One Cause is when, oh. you're, when you're looking at making their lives easier? Um, you know, we really, our, our goal is to provide tools so that you can focus on your mission. Mm. And those tools can then work for you and yeah. help you raise more money and save time. That is really what we're, we're trying to do yeah. and trying to help you with. Um, and if we can do those two things, I will be a happy person. So, and hopefully our nonprofits will too, because I would rather the nonprofits spend time with their constituents, you know, talking about their mission um, and then just let the technology work for them. Well, on the Fundraising Elevator podcast, we believe that when we all work together, we're all headed up. And we always ask our guests one question of uh, what is your best tip for a fearless fundraiser out there? One tip that would help them to head up. Oh, oh, that's a great question. Um, let's see. One tip. Um, I would say if you have an idea, go for it. Oh, mm -hmm. don't don't second guess yourself because we do that. A yes. Lot. Yeah. But if you have an idea, give it a try and go for it. Um, I just think that um, 
some, sometimes we're just too afraid to give it a try, and it doesn't mean it's a lifelong commitment. Just give it a shot. And um, I've been so blessed um, by trying different things, and so yes. I hope that they would too. So. Well, thank you for being here with us today yes. in the studio. We appreciate you joining us. It's been wonderful. Thank you both. Yeah, thank you. you. All right, Reggie. Reggie Rivers. Hello there. How are Hi, you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. It's good to see you in person. Thank you. Good to see you. It's been a while. It's been a while. Yes. We have podcasted before. Yes, we have. But it's been many years. Um, how many years? Like... Maybe five or I was thinking four, four years. Maybe four. Yeah. Yeah. I think well, maybe even less than that. But I think it might have been in 2021. It might have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Well, we got to know each other around the time of COVID. Yes. And everything changing in the events world, and you and your team, your gala team. We're really early adopters to the virtual event space. Right. And that's what got us into some, like, podcasting around those topics back at that time. And we never met each other in person. So this is the first time we're, like, in the flesh together. (laughs) Yes, yeah, that's true. Right. You know? Right. I know when the COVID hit, I I remember vividly, it was a weekend in March and two events canceled that weekend on it was thursday and we had a friday and saturday event they both canceled and then we started looking at our calendar and it's like wow what are our clients next week going to do and the week after that going to do now we didn't think that this thing was going to last for two years yeah we just thought for the next few weeks and so we immediately said hey what if we did a virtual gala Mm -hmm. and we just we're like, yeah, we could do a virtual gala. We just jump on Zoom. We could figure this out. And so we started working on it. And in the end, it looked like we were visionary. It was like, oh, my God, yeah. you guys pivoted to this so quickly. But it was really all we were trying to do was make something temporary to help our clients of the next two to three weeks. Yeah. It ended up we ended up, did 130 uh, virtual galas during the I pandemic. Mean, it pivoted your, like your whole business it for did. a while. It did. You know, and now we're back into, I guess we, we could just say normalcy again. You know, I don't know that we don't. We don't like talk about COVID so much, but at the same time, it's like if we were there up on the ground trying to evolve our businesses at that time. Oh, yes. Remember when? Yes. But let's talk about now because a lot has evolved since then. I'm curious because we talked during that time and now everything's been, I feel like it's been back to normal for right. a while, right. you know? I've been going to events for a while now. What are some of the ways that you started like pivoting back into in person that was maybe different than the pre COVID in person events? Like, was there anything that you learned from the virtual setting that you have taken now into best practices for events now? Yeah, I think that doing virtual gala has really forced us to think about the details about how an event runs and how the information is captured and then how the information is distributed to the audience during the the gala. Um, When we were always live in person, we often didn't get too involved in what the script looks like or the timeline or what the messaging is, you know, we, but with virtual, it was like essential that we were all on the same page. And so we started using Google Drive folders to put all the information in. We started being much more meticulous about the questions that we asked about the event to gather all of that. And so as we transitioned out of COVID, all of that stuff stayed with us because it was really a valuable addition uh, to our preparation for the event. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And now you're doing some things and you're going to talk about this tomorrow in your session. Well, I, I think this is great. You're helping people be more simple I, yeah. to raise money. Yes. <laughs> Let's yes. talk about that. Yeah. So one of the things that we bump into in the nonprofit world is that the people who are drawn to do this work don't love asking for money. Mm. They love doing the work. They love helping people. They love supporting people. So then when it comes time to actually ask for money, they are very uncomfortable with just saying, will you support us? Mm -hmm. Instead, you tend to shield yourself or protect yourself by saying, well, how about if we 
if we offer you one of these and everybody who makes a donation to us is going to get one of these pens. The Spachatchkis. Um, yeah, so what if yeah. we offer you one of these? Everybody who makes a donation is going to get one of these. And so this idea that everyone who gives something is going to get something is pretty much all... Everything in the gala fundraising model fits into that. Hey, sponsors, if you sponsor us, we're going to give you the signage and these mentions. Hey, uh, guests, if you buy a, t a ticket, we're going to give you a meal. Hey, if you participate in our silent auction, you, you might win the item. Live auction, you might win the item. The paddle raiser is the only time in the program where we're just selling your mission. You're just saying, this is the work we do. This is why it's important. Here's how you can help us. Will you support us? And that's a scary thing for charities to do, but we found you will raise way, way more money by just telling them your mission and asking for support than you will trying to exchange something with them. Mm. Okay, so walk me through that paddle raise. Like, what have you found with that one, I guess, segue or segment yes. of the event? Like, is there any way in doing the paddle race that you found to be really successful when you're doing that and making that ask? Yes, we we have a very structured process that we we follow, and that's part of what I'm going to be talking about in my presentation tomorrow are some tips on how to make the paddle raiser better. Um, you know, there's simple things like issue a paddle to every every guest that comes in the door. That sounds intuitive, but I've been standing behind the checkout tables and I've watched people. They they come to the, the table, Mr. and Mrs. Smith walk up to the table and the person who's checking them in says, hey, welcome, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Would you like a paddle in, in case you make any kind of donation or bid today? And they say, no, thank you. Yeah. And so now this couple walks off. They don't have a paddle. Yeah. And so we try to tell cherries, don't offer them a paddle, assign them a paddle and just hand put it to it on them. Put the table. Yeah. Sure. Well, you put it on, you know, there's different ways to get it in their hands. Yeah. There's some risk with putting it on the table. But, yes, okay. in some way, give it to them. When they arrive, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, welcome here. You are number 243. Here you go. Okay. And just hand it to them. Yeah. And so that way everybody has a paddle if they want to participate. Um, another a simple thing that charities do a lot. We'll meet with a charity, and they'll say, yeah, we've tried paddle raisers. It doesn't really work with us. Um, and I said, well, how big was your event last year? Well, we had 300 people in the room. How much did you raise in your paddle raiser? Well, we raised about $25,000. I say, okay, let's look at your timeline. And I'll look at their timeline, and I see that, oh, the paddle raiser was at 915. It was at the end of the event. Mm -hmm. I say, just take that paddle raiser and move it forward in your event. Mm -hmm. Put it at 830. Mm -hmm. And just making that one change, they, instead of raising 25000 they raised seventy five thousand dollars and so we realized that night we call nine o'clock the witching hour of fundraising yeah. that if you wait to try to do your fundraising then you just bump into too many things people's bladders are full they yeah. got to go to the bathroom the the people who were a little had a little bit too much in the cocktail hour were feeling yeah. good now they're starting to feel cruddy people are starting to feel tired of sitting in the chair and yeah. listening they're starting to worry about their babysitters expiring they're i just, have to say the babysitters <laughs> texting yeah they're coming home. exactly so yeah. there's all that stuff and you can just avoid it by mm -hmm. moving your paddle raiser earlier into the program. So it's a lot of stuff like that that's very simple to implement, yeah. but it, it creates a big difference. Simple tweaks. I like yes. that. What's the favorite, your favorite part of an event? Oh, You've my done, how many events have you done oh. in your career now? Thousands? Well, I wouldn't say thousands, but hundreds, you know, Hundred? 600, 700, okay. something like that. My company has done um, a thousand since we officially formulated in, uh, in 2013. Um, and so my, my favorite part is the paddle raiser. I mean, my favorite part is just that moment when we're asking the audience for their support and they're giving their support. And I can see the people, the staff members of the charity in the back of the room sometimes are crying because they didn't realize that the audience loved them that much. They didn't realize that people cared about their mission that much they're you know it's, it's overwhelming to them sometimes when you know they see an audience donate two hundred thousand dollars and they're like we didn't know these people believed in us like that but yeah wow. they do and what is one thing that's exciting to you right now about your work um Just in a general ai is it okay I don't how know how it's going to exactly intersect us. We we use it to um, do background research. Mm -hmm. We use it to help us write our blog posts. 
We use it to help us make our PowerPoint slides. Mm -hmm. um, we use it to review things like we're training GPTs to kind of review um, our, our, our calls with our, our consultants. Like when we're doing Zoom calls with all of our clients, we have, uh, we're, start, we're just starting to use Fathom uh, oh, AI yeah. to mm -hmm. kind of create a summary and, mm -hmm. and then we're evaluating like how effectively are we covering the topics that we need to cover mm -hmm. in each of these types of meetings. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just convinced that, you know, AI is here and what's going to happen is everybody who's you, not using AI at some point, they're going to be on the outside. And so uh, we're just trying to, as a company, say, how can we use it? How can this help charities raise more money? How can it help us help charities raise more money? Because if, if we're not trying to use it, I just think we're going to wake up one day and it's like the world has passed us by. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I want to ask you about how all of this might in some way tie back to things that you learned on the football field. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Josh Meyer told me, asked Reggie about football. Yes. Um, and I remember first, when I first learned about you, I watched your TED talk on mm -hmm. that and some lessons you'd learned in the, on the football field and leadership. Is there anything that you would now relate to this adoption of AI that you think is it's relative? Oh, yeah, 100%. So. In football, in the NFL, there's tremendous parity. So every team has all the same stuff. They've all got superstars. They all have money to spend on players. They all have everything. And they're all bound by this really strict set of rules. There's seven officials on the field who are compliance officers who are watching every play. Holding, you can't do that. Oh, yeah, you ran out of bounds. You can't do that. Right? There's just this environment where you are so restricted in what you can do. Yet, the only way to succeed is to be creative. You've got to constantly innovate. It is, you can never say, hey, we figured out. Our offense is the best offense that's ever been made. You know why it's the best offense that's never been made? Because every week, the defense doesn't know what they're going to get from you. It's not because you're doing the same thing every time. It's because you're changing every time, every week you're changing. And so for me, I look at all these things that are happening in the world and the economy is like, yeah, we got to keep changing. We can't, we can't stand still. We can't ever say, oh, we figured this out. This is the way to do it. And it's the only way to do it. No, as soon as you start saying that, you have fallen behind. And so I, I think that that drives me a lot to just constantly not be afraid of what the next new thing is, to just be curious about it. Yeah. And make new plays. Right. Yeah. Make new plays. Use AI to make new plays. Yes. Use different scenarios within an event, uh, an event galas, to make new plays. Right. Yeah. The other analogy I would make to the NFL is that I was a running back. Could you Can you guess what my primary job was as a running back? I don't know. Was it not running? No. I don't know anything about football, Reggie. <laughs> okay. Well, if I were asking people who are knowledgeable about football, what's a running back's primary job? They would say, oh, to carry the ball or score uh -huh. touchdowns or make blocks or catch, catch the ball or, you know, any, anything. All those things are part of the job. The primary job is to get tackled. That's a running back's job. See, now, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> And so people are surprised really? by that. They say, yeah, the Why? job is to get tackled. Like if I was here trying to recruit you as a running back, mm -hmm. I, I'd be saying, hey, listen, we need running back. We need people who can get tackled. If you're the kind of person that gets your leg broken every time you get tackled, I we do. can't use you. Yeah. If, if you're the kind of person that gets your feelings hurt every time you get tackled, we can't use you. If you drop the ball every time you get tackled, we can't use you. We're going to hand you the ball. These 11 trained killers are going to yeah. come after you. They're going to hit you. They're going to hit you hard. They're going to try to knock you on the ground and it's difficult you'll get injured we need people who can get tackled yeah. and so people think that the running back's job is to score touchdowns and get the glory and it's like no your job is to carry this ball for three or four yards and get tackled get up come back to the huddle and do it again and i think when we understand what a running back's job is we yeah. understand what everybody's job is our job is not the pretty stuff our job is not the easy stuff our job is to go out there and get tackled if you're ever watching a football game, I know you don't know much about football. I, mean, I watch you, it. I just, it doesn't like necessarily, I don't absorb all, all that's going on. Understood. It's okay. <laughs> 
But if you're ever watching a game and you see a running back who's on the sideline and his jersey is completely clean, yeah. do you think that you would say, oh, that guy must be a really good running back. He never gets tackled. Or would you say, no, that guy's not in the game. He hasn't been in. Yeah. The only people with clean jerseys are the people who are not in the game. That's what I would think. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. so as fundraisers, as whatever profession that we're in, our job is to go out there and get tackled. And your jersey, your uniform is going to get dirty. And if you, everybody who's in the business has a dirty uniform, you think, oh, no, I see these people on Instagram and they live this beautiful life and they never get tackled. Yeah, well, then maybe they're not doing what they actually say they're doing. Everybody who's doing it is getting tackled. Yeah. I just think they're not showing it on social media. Right. Yes. <laughs> I love that. And I had no idea. Yeah. At all about yeah. that. Oh, cool. All right. Well, what else? What will you leave us with? What What um, should we know? What's something that you're doing right now that we should know about? Well, um, what's something I'm doing right now? I think it's really just I'm try I'm training more and more people all the time to become fundraisers. Mm -hmm. That we just have a, we have a young lady who joined our team. Uh, she did our her second event. On Saturday night, she helped raise eighty thousand mm. dollars, and wow. we've really come up with a formula to kind of help take somebody who's never done it before yeah. and help them be successful on their first go. That's because amazing. no charity wants to be somebody's test event. No, and so we have to really choose the right people who have some speaking experience, and then we train them. Every, we have nine auctioneers on our team. Nobody was an auctioneer before they joined our team. Huh. There were media personalities, stage performers, yeah. stand-up comedians, and so we look for these particular traits of empathy and compassion uh -huh. and ability to manage a crowd, and then say, if you have that, I can teach you the auctioneering piece of the pie. Yeah. And so we do, and so it's just really exciting to launch more and more people into this work yeah. because that's what I really have a passion for. I want to, when I was doing it by myself, I could only wrap my arms around however many people I can wrap my arms around. In order to have a bigger impact, I need to lock arms with more people. And so now we're, you know, this year we'll do 175 events. I'm only 25 out of that 175 yeah. where I used to be the vast majority. And so that's really rewarding. And that's, that's what awesome. I'm working on now. Well. I'm going to come ask you for a job one day if my thing doesn't pan out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I love it. All right. Well, hey, Reggie Rivers, so good to see you. It's Thank good you to for see being you. here. Thank you. Thanks for sharing your thoughts, and I'll, I'll see you around the campus. That sounds good. All Thank right. you very much. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>well fearless fundraisers that's all we have for you today thank you so much for joining and listening in i want to ch thank my fantastic co-host matt vitzagai as well as all the podcasters taylor shanklin Kristen Steele, samantha swaim and cindy wagman we couldn't do it without you and we also couldn't do it without all of our amazing guests who shared their inspiration with all of you today absolutely don and also a special thank you to our friends from utopia for their behind the scenes support and production make sure to tune in for all of the Rays 2024 episodes so you don't miss out on any of this amazing content. Yeah, we don't want to miss a single episode. That is a wrap. Thanks for joining us for this amazing Rays experience. I'm Matt Bitsagai. I'm Don Lego. Stay, Stay fearless. fearless.